through the tool which is really the origin of the power of supersymmetry. It's the fact that in its simplest form, the superpotential is a holomorphic function of the fields, locally holomorphic. And, and then I, I told you kind of pointers that the same idea appears in many other places in string theory or in field theory. The notion of BPS states, chiral operators, chiral ring, and half, half supersymmetric object, and so on and so forth. And most, but I emphasize not all, of the calculations which can be done really stem from this fact. If you go back, how do we understand duality? Why do we trust duality, both in field theory and in string theory? A lot of that comes from this idea that some objects, the superpotential in n equals 1, or the prepotential in n equals 2, or some masses of BPS particles and so forth, all these things are controlled by holomorphic objects. So this is really a theme in supersymmetric theories, and we demonstrated it in the non-renormalization theorem, which is really not only a beautiful property of, of supersymmetric field theories, but as Nima emphasized in his talk, this is one of the reasons we expect supersymmetry to be present at the TV range. He talked about the hierarchy problem and the way supersymmetry controls the hierarchy problem, the way the hierarchy problem is solved in string theory is really, if you go to the root of it, is through the non-renormalization theorem, and the root of that is through holomorphy. So this was the first half of the talk. The second half of the talk, I th started discussing spontaneous supersymmetry breaking, which I will continue today. And this is, again, closely tied to Nima's lectures. So he told you that we had coordinated the talks. So I'll provide a module into his discussion of the MSSM. And the only thing which is important from this module is a field X that I've already started discussing last time. This was a chiral superfield, which figured in our example number one. So example number one was a very simple theory, which had Kähler potential, which was canonical. This is the same X which will appear in many places in my talk. And then a linear superpotential. And then we said, well, this example is a bit too degenerate. First of all, because the field is free. And second, it has a massless boson. So at the very least, we would like to get rid of the massless boson. And the simplest way of doing it is by turning on a non-trivial killer potential. And we worked out example number two. K was x absolute value square, and then there was minus. The minus sign is important. 1 over m square, x to the fourth, and there could be high order corrections. And w is fx. And then we found that there is a potential, v, which is f square, 1 plus 4 little x square over m square plus dot, dot, dot. And the physics of that was that at some scale m, this non-renormalizable field theory breaks down. And again, it's tied to the way Nima thought about field theory. You think about field theory not as a theory which has to be renormalizable. In fact, most field theories are not renormalizable. They should all be viewed as theories with a cutoff. And then there's a physical question at what scale the cutoff comes in, where the physics of this is that the cutoff represents additional physics that we have not yet described. So this is a good description of the theory, as long as we don't get to the scale m. At the scale m, this theory is, this theory is never renormalizable, but if you compute diagrams, you will see that they're, they're divergent at the scale m. And Nima really likes to sprinkle various factors of 4 pi there. Uh, but I will be careless about factors of 4 pi here. So, this theory breaks down at the scale m, but notice something. In, so at the scale m, there is some new physics which produces this scalar potential, but we are way below the scale m, and we see that we have an effective description of supersymmetry super breaking. And unlike example number one, here the boson x is no longer massless, so we can integrate it out. What does it mean to integrate it out? The mass of the boson is f 
times 2 over m. We can read it from the quadratic term here. And notice that if m is much bigger than root f, then the hierarchy of scales that we have is as follows. At very high scale m, our low energy approximation breaks down. At the much lower energy, characterized by the mass of the boson, we still have a good description here. But now we can continue and integrate stuff out and go to construct an effective Lagrangian at even lower energies. This effective Lagrangian will be very interesting because in this Lagrangian, supersymmetry is there and it is realized linearly. We wrote everything in terms of superspace, just as you learned in the talks by Bagger and others. But now, supersymmetry will no longer be realized linearly because we are going to integrate out the boson. So now the spectrum is no longer supersymmetric. Supersymmetry cannot be realized linearly. However, supersymmetry is still a good symmetry of the spectrum. And since it's a good symmetry of the spectrum, we should have a Lagrangian which is exactly supersymmetric. Example, in QCD, we have chiral symmetry. There is SU2 cross SU2 or SU3 cross SU3, which acts on the fundamental quarks. The symmetry is realized linearly. Then we integrate out some stuff, and we find an effective description in terms of pions. The symmetry is still there. The symmetry is not lost, except that it's re now realized nonlinearly. So we can do the same thing here. And this example is so simple that we can actually do it explicitly. So I started doing it last time. And if we look at the killer potential, so we have the integral d4 theta of k, and that includes lots of terms, among them minus 1 over m squared, the f component of the superfield x dagger, x dagger, minus psi psi plus fx x plus complex conjugate plus dot dot dot. So this is one of the terms in k. This term is interesting. Because if we try to integrate out x, how do we do that? The general rule of integrating out stuff at tree level is shift all the light fields from their expectation values. It doesn't matter if these are fermions or bosons. It doesn't matter what their equation of motion says. Make them arbitrary. Solve the equation of motion of the massive fields and substitute the solution back in. This is classical integration out. Quantum mechanically, we can compute loops around that. So let's work classically. So classically, we are trying to integrate out x. So we should solve the equation of motion of x. And the equation of motion of x, if solved, there might be some factors of 2 and so forth, leads to 1 over fx psi psi. And then there are higher order corrections that we're not included. So a classical physicist would say, well, a fermion cannot have a value. So psi psi on the right-hand side is 0. And therefore, x is 0. This is the correct value if you measure the value of x at the minimum of the potential. This potential that appears here, this potential, looks like that. So this is the 0 here. But somebody who is a little bit more open-minded than this lowbrow classical physicist would say, wait a minute, it's not exactly 0. It's psi psi. And in the low energy theory, we still have a fermion. So this x is not really macroscopic. It's not classical. So when we say that x at the minimum is 0, this is the classical answer. We measure the value with some apparatus. No apparatus, no measuring apparatus, can give you the classical answer, psi psi. Psi psi is not a classical number. This doesn't mean that it's 0. Well, let's see how it comes about. We take this classical solution. We plug it back into Lagrangian. So now the cast of characters, which we started with, was big x, which was little x plus theta psi. And I suppressed factors of root 2. Unfortunately, Bagger is not here to fix my factors of root 2 or to complain about it. So the theta psi plus theta square fx. So now I'm going to keep psi and fx as fields in my Lagrangian and integrate out the only object which is massive, namely little x. So what is the Lagrangian? The Lagrangian is very easy. 
there were terms of the form psi dagger d slash psi. That was there before. That's not too exciting. We also had, it comes usually with a minus sign, f sub x absolute value square. That comes from the kinetic term. We also had dx absolute value square. And we had f fx plus f fx dagger. So that's what we have if we just drop the x to the fourth term. Right? This is the free Lagrangian in example number one. Now all we need to do is take this x and substitute it in here. So everything is the same, but instead of this term, I can write here psi psi over fx, d of that, all this absolute value square. So now we see that the substitution for x in terms of psi and f produced a non-trivial Lagrangian for us. So this low energy fermion, after we integrate out the x, is no longer a free fermion as it was in example number one, but instead we get a new interaction terms, but instead we get new interaction terms. So let's erase this more clearly and see what we have here. Fx is still an auxiliary field. It doesn't have a kinetic term. Since it doesn't have a kinetic term, we can solve for it. We can solve its equation of motion. And to linear order, Fx is minus f. I took f to be real. But that's not exact because f also appears here. So if we really solve the equation of motion for f, we'll get higher order corrections, which are bilinear in the fermions and have some derivative and then four fermions, etc. Fortunately, this expansion stops, and this is really a straightforward exercise and you can, which you can just do. Vary this Lagrangian with respect to fx, take such an ansatz, solve it in, derive the correction, and in perturbation theory in the number of fermions you can find the solution and you see that it stops. But you don't have to do that. We have two equivalent descriptions of the low energy physics. The first of them is given by this Lagrangian, which includes the fermion and the auxiliary field, but not little x, which we integrated out. And the second includes only the fermion. We have a few surprises here. Surprise number one. We started with the Lagrangian, which broke down at the scale m. And then we went to lower energy and we found this massive scalar whose mass is little f over m. And now we go to lower energy and all memory of m is gone. The parameter m dropped out of the effective Lagrangian. The low energy effective Lagrangian depends on the fermions, if you wish, on the auxiliary field, and one parameter little f. Have we seen that before anywhere? Yes, we have. In pion physics, which is always the example which is good to keep in mind, the leading order pion Lagrangian depends only on one parameter, f pi. It's not even a parameter. You can say that it just sets the scale. So there is a scale in the problem f pi. The analog of that here is little f. And this is typical of theories where we integrate out stuff and we go to lower energies. All the uninteresting details of the short distance physics are gone. The macroscopic physics depends on far fewer parameters. We say, we discuss it thinning of degrees of freedom, removing operators, C theorem, this thing has various names in the literature. But the objects which really affect long distance physics are far smaller than the object which affects sh short distance physics. This is both good and bad. It's good that it allows us to compute things in the low energy approximation without knowing what's going on at short distance. The success of the standard model, particle physics, at which Nima outlined yesterday, really relies on this fact. There could be tons of extra stuff at 10 TeV, 1 TeV, doesn't matter for the low energy observer. It's also bad because once we understand the standard model, it's a lot harder to see what this short distance physics is. Because the short distance physics was well hidden by this 
general idea due to Wilson that as you go to low energy, you can forget whatever happened at short distance. So this, we see here a clear demonstration of this. We started with a theory which depends on the parameter and you could say that I pull this K out of a hat or there could be high order corrections in K. All this is totally irrelevant for the low energy theory. The low energy theory, its leading approximation, depends only on the scale little f. Is this Lagrangian supersymmetric? Is it obviously supersymmetric? I claim that it is. The reason is that we can write the Lagrangian that we end up with exactly as example number one. But declare that the x that appears here is not a free field as in example number one, but instead it satisfies a constraint. And if you look at this classical solution that we had here, you plug it in there, or if you wish alternatively, take arbitrary x, sorry, arbitrary psi, arbitrary fx, and put for the boson this answer, you will see that x squared is zero. Going back to pion physics, is this a new thing? No, not at all. What's the pion physics Lagrangian? So ex the analog of example number one is known as the linear sigma model. We write a linear sigma model in which SU2 cross SU2 is linearly realized. The object in the story is a two by two matrix and we do what we do with it. We can also integrate out the sigma field analog of integrating out the bo massive boson X and find a Lagrangian which looks free except one thing. There's a quadratic Lagrangian. It has an F pi square. It has a d mu u absolute value square and dagger. And the only, no, and the nonlinearity or the interest in the theory comes from the fact that u is not any two by two matrix, but u is a unitary matrix. So u satisfies a constraint, a constraint which is invariant under the symmetries. This is the analog of the statement that in pi on Lagrangian, the matrix u, which we use, is always unitary. And now we ask ourselves, is this theory supersymmetric? Obviously, yes. We wrote a supersymmetric Lagrangian in superspace, the way Bagger instructed us to do, and we impose a constraint which is supersymmetric. Therefore, we don't even need to check that the theory is supersymmetric. Why did I go through all this? Nima is going to discuss the MSSM. The MSSM that he will discuss will be a theory in which supersymmetry is explicitly broken. But he will have in mind a model, in fact, a model which includes such an X, in which supersymmetry is spontaneously broken. And if we ignore gravity for this purpose, and supersymmetry is spontaneously broken, the low energy spectrum is the low energy spectrum of the MSSM, which Nima will include, plus one more fermion which Nima will probably not discuss in detail. It's rarely discussed in detail in the MSSM literature. This extra addition, additional massless particle is the Goldstino. And a person who really lives by the Wilsonian dogma feels bad excluding the Goldstino from the MSSM. The Lagrangian should include the, MSS, the Goldstino. The reason is that the rule is the following. You put a cutoff, and your theory should describe everything which is below that cutoff. And the Goldstino is there. The Goldstino makes sure that the MSSM Lagrangian that people write down, in which supersymmetry is explicitly broken, is in fact fully supersymmetric. And the way it's exactly <coughs> supersymmetric, supersymmetry is spontaneously broken rather than explicitly broken, is uh, provided by the Goldstino. And this is something I learned from Nima. So thank you. So this was a nice way of getting supersymmetry breaking. Oh, I would like to give an exercise for you. Do this exercise, which is not that hard. Derive a Lagrangian which includes only fermions and show that the Lagrangian that you find is a Lagrangian that was really the birthplace of supersymmetry. It's called the Akula Volkov Lagrangian. This is a Lagrangian which includes only psi, the Goldstino, and supersymmetry is realized non-linearly, and this is the first time 
four-dimensional supersymmetry as a field theory appeared in the literature, in the work of Akulov and Volkov. So it's really surprising that we have to go to rather sophisticated things in our presentations of supersymmetry in order to find the material of the first paper about supersymmetry. And there's lessons from an old man, you know, research is always like this. What appears in the paper is not the way the research progressed. This is usually the last week of the research. <laughs> and the people who really smile are the people who have experienced it more than once. <laughs> so this was the exercise. But you might feel a little bit uneasy because I pulled example number two out of a hat. Why did I take this one? And besides, you were brainwashed that field theories need to be renormalizable. So you'll feel a lot, a lot more comfortable if we go up in energy and derive example number two out of something else which is more complete, which is renormalizable. So our example number three, which I'm moving to now, is a renormalizable field theory, which leads to example number two in its low energy approximation. So this is a theme in physics, which will be seen in many of the talks. We constantly go between Lagrangians at different scales. Either we try to work our way up to higher and higher energies. We have a non-renormalizable Lagrangian. And then we try to, quote unquote, UV complete it, find a more complete theory at shorter distances where we can push the cutoff to be higher. Or conversely, we do the opposite, which was the theme of Witten's talks. You start from a Lagrangian at short distance, and you're trying to determine what will be the answer at long distance. So 90% of what is done in our field is this. Given the Lagrangian at one scale, either short distance or long distance, find the Lagrangian at the other scale, which leads to it, either going up or down the renormalization group. So let's give such an example. So this brings me to example number three. It will still have a field X, and that is known as the Orafferty model. I like to say that the most difficult thing in the Orafferty model is to, to be able to spell Orafferty. There is a GH. I think I put it in the right place. In my notes, it's correct. Yeah, I think that's correct. So this is the Orafferty model. Yes? Yes. That's correct. Oh, you're putting stuff which is way too sophisticated for my presentation. I promise you that uh, later in my talk, perhaps even today, you'll have a perfect opportunity to ask this question. Because it, I think at the moment you, you use input that I have not yet presented. And I assure you that you'll have this opportunity to ask the question again. You might not want to use it anymore, but you'll have the opportunity. So example number three, due to Mr. Rafferty, we have the same X, which will play the same role, but now we add two chiral superfields, phi one, and the kinetic terms are canonical. So you see the kinetic terms are canonical so that the Lagrangian would be perfectly renormalizable. And we'll write a superpotential. First we'll have the term, which was really the hero of previous story, this fx, which appeared with us already from example number one. But we add some additional terms, m phi one, phi two. So phi one and phi two form a massive chiral superfield, two chiral superfield, and an interaction term, a Yukawa coupling h. It's convenient to put a two here, x phi one square. Now, this Lagrangian is perfectly natural and the very broad conditions of naturalness. Naturalness means you write all the terms which are allowed by the symmetries. You declare what the symmetries of the model are, 
In this case, there is supersymmetry, but there is also an R symmetry, and there is a discrete Z2 symmetry. And if you impose all these symmetries, this is the most that you can write, which is consistent with renormalizability. If you take the point of view of these lectures, where the Lagrangian does not have to be renormalizable, you can add to these, both to K and to W, additional terms, terms which are suppressed by one over a higher scale, and we're not going to say anything about the higher scales. The nice thing about renormalizable theory is that we really don't need to discuss that, and the physics remains invariant as we remove this higher scale to infinity. In non-renormalizable field theories, that's not true, unless you're more careful. Okay, what does this model do? Well, the first thing to do in every supersymmetric model is to ask is supersymmetry broken or not, and the way to do that is to search for stationary points of the superpotential. So we take this superpotential, this object, and we differentiate it with respect to the three different fields, with respect to x, with respect to phi 1, with respect to phi 2, and you derive a potential. And the potential is such is the sum of the squares, so v equals h over 2 phi 1 square plus f this is it and where these are the derivatives with respect to the various fields, this is the derivative with respect to x, this is the derivative with respect to phi 2, and this is the derivative with respect to phi 1. Now we look for zero energy solutions, and it's easy to see that there aren't any. Because if we try to set this object to zero, phi 1 has to vanish, but then we are in trouble here. If we try to set this one to zero, then we are in trouble here. So there is no way for supersymmetry to be unbroken. And this theory, if you look at it, breaks supersymmetry. What does the potential look like? If we integrate out phi 1 and phi 2, and we do the best we can, at least when this h is small, we find one massless particle, x, and this is v, and this is f squared. This is the potential. So the low energy approximation of the Orofity model is precisely our example number one. So that's why example number one is not as artificial and as useless as it might appear. So example number one appears as the low energy approximation for this theory. And along this place, phi two, has an expectation value which is minus h x phi 1 over m. And the masses of the particles depend on where we are in the space of x's. So x looks, the space of x's looks like a moduli space of vacua. The classical theory has a moduli space of vacua parametrized by x. For every value of x, we have a vacuum, classical vacuum. But the vacua are inequivalent. As we move around in x space from one vacuum to the other, and we diagonalize the small fluctuations of this potential, we can work out the spectrum, and the spectrum depends on where we are. Since the spectrum of massive particles depends on where we are, these vacua are inequivalent. This is unlike the pion Lagrangian, as if we move from one expectation value of the pions to another, a symmetry relates all these vacua. Here, that's not the case. No symmetry relates these vacua. These vacua are inequivalent. Now, normally, such a degeneracy between states in a quantum theory is extremely unnatural. Already in quantum mechanics, we don't have accidental degeneracy between states, between energy levels. You know what happens to energy levels under the slightest perturbation if they degenerate? They repel. Energy levels like to repel each other because in the quantum theory, we don't have accidental degeneracy. The same is true here, and we'll soon see how quantum corrections lift this degeneracy, very much like the way it does always in quantum mechanics. 
Now, a lot of the excitement in supersymmetric theory stems from the fact that supersymmetric theories, if supersymmetry is not broken, sometimes have an inequivalent set of vacua already in the quantum theory. So the magic of supersymmetry can be stronger than this desire of quantum theory to lift degeneracy. But that's not the case in this example. It will be the case in more sophisticated examples I'll present later. So here we have a modular space of vacua in the classical theory, which is not controlled by any symmetry. And it's indeed going to be lifted soon. Soon, I mean in five minutes. And therefore, we call it a pseudo-moduli space of vacuum. It's pseudo-moduli space because it looks like a moduli space of vacuum, but in fact, it's not. So now I'm going to do the one-loop correction, compute it, and show that this vacuum degeneracy, this accidental vacuum degeneracy, is lifted already at one loop. And what will happen is that the potential will look like this, and the theory will have one ground state here. So how do we do, how do we compute the one-loop correction? Well, again, I can use Nima's lecture yesterday, where he described the effective potential. So the effective potential at one loop is obtained as follows. We look at different points x along the moduli space. We diagonalize the small fluctuations, so we work out the spectrum of the theory as a function of x. We find a bunch, a bunch of bosons and a bunch of fermions. Their masses are not the same because supersymmetry is broken. It's a completely straightforward exercise, which I strongly encourage you to do. And we have a TA session in the afternoon. I'll be the TA, and you have to submit your exercises then. You can work them out during Melanie's talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do that. So we work out the spectrum, and we have some bosons, M bosons, MI, which depend on where we are in X space. And we have some fermions, and fermions, which depends where we are in X space. And now all we need to do is sum a half H bar omega for all these oscillators, recalling that bosons come with a plus sign and fermions come with a minus sign. Bosons come with a plus sign because in the harmonic oscillator, the ground state energy goes up by a half H bar omega. For fermions, it goes down. If the theory is exactly supersymmetric for every boson, there is a degenerate fermion. And the a half h bar omega of the bosons exactly cancels the a half h bar omega of the fermions. But here, the spectrum is not supersymmetric. You can work it out, and it's not. And then if you do the computation the way Nima did, or outline, you get the following formula. 1 over 64 pi square super trace of m to the fourth log m square over some m cutoff square. Where this m is the mass matrix, and this is a super trace. Super trace means that the bosons come with the plus and the fermions come with the minus. And one beautifully described supergroups this morning. So this is the analog of trace for groups. For supergroups, we have to do the super trace. And actually, to be precise, it's for algebras versus super algebra. When one talked about groups, he really meant the algebra. And when he talked about, when we talk about the trace in the algebra, this is generalized to the super trace for the super algebra. And I'd like to make a number of comments about this beautiful formula. Number one, the vacuum energy, if you just do the one-loop computation, sum over the bosons, what you normally get, or minus sum over fermion, you normally get a quartic divergence. There's a lambda to the fourth there, cutoff to the fourth. What multiplies the cut the cutoff to the fourth? This is this. This is the most divergent piece. So the most divergent piece is in general m cut off to the fourth with the coefficient, which is the number of bosons minus the number of fermions. 
at very, very high energies, the mass of the boson or the mass of the fermion doesn't matter. The mass is much smaller than the cutoff. So as we go to extremely high energies, we get a cutoff to the fourth times the number of species in the loop. In our theory, the number of bosons equals the number of fermions, and therefore, we don't get this coding divergence. This is true in any supersymmetric theory. If supersymmetry is linearly realized, the number of bosons is the same as the number of fermions, and therefore, the cutoff to the fourth contribution always cancels out. Next thing we get is m cutoff square. Quadratic divergences. Now, you will often hear the statement that supersymmetric theories don't have quadratic divergences. This is a bit too quick. So try not to memorize this sentence. Supersymmetric theories, in fact, can have quadratic divergences. But they do not arise here. Because the quadratic divergences, just as here we have the number of bosons minus the number of fermions, on dimensional grounds, we should have something proportional to m squared. So for every species which runs in the loop, we get m squared. And therefore, we must have the supertrace of m squared. And there are some pi's and so forth which are not important. So I encouraged you to compute the spectrum of fermions and bosons in this theory. And if you do this exercise, you will see that the supertrace miraculously vanishes. In this case, the supertrace miraculously vanishes. So I'll give you another exercise. All this is for the TA session today show that in every renormalizable theory, the supertrace always vanishes. This is really a two-line computation. So in every renormalizable field theory, the supertrace of the spectrum always vanishes. That's not true in non-renormalizable field theories. If we take a theory which is not renormalizable, in particular if the Cayley potential is not canonical, the supertrace of m square does not vanish, and therefore we can have quadratic divergences. So when I said earlier that people always say supersymmetric theories don't have quadratic divergences, this is one example where this thing is not true. You can have quadratic divergences if the Cayley potential is not renormalizable. So if you're really ambitious, take this model, add some corrections to the Cayley potential, and check that the supertrace no longer vanishes. But in our case, the theory is renormalizable, so the supertrace vanishes, and therefore we don't have quadratic divergences. Next thing in the hierarchy is a log divergence. And if you look at the formula there, there is a log of m cutoff square. See, the formula I wrote up there is really infinite because it depends on the cutoff. And the coefficient is proportional to the supertrace of m to the fourth. And the magic that the supertrace of m squared vanishes is no longer true for m to the fourth. What do we do about this log divergence? Our answer is infinite. So that means that our effective potential is infinite. Any suggestions? So we were lucky we didn't have the m to the fourth. We were also lucky, which even looks even more miraculous, we didn't have the m square, but now we are stuck with the logarithm. What do we do about the logarithm? Any suggestion? Should we throw the theory away because the answer is infinite? Yes? Well, I want to see more hands before I... Okay. Yeah, the second one. Yep. Sorry? That's interesting. Any other suggestions? Sorry? Does the logarithm magically point out of the constant? That's not true. It could have happened, but it does not. The supertrace of m to the fourth is not a constant. It depends on x. And even if here it doesn't happen at higher orders, this will happen. Yes? Excellent. Excellent. So logarithms should be absorbable. You should be able to absorb them in redefinition of the couplings in the theory. So what we do when we have such a log divergence we go back and we redefine what we mean by the various constants. In this particular case, it's wave function renormalization. So let's recall the lecture yesterday. 
this k is not going to be renormalized. Sorry, this w is not going to be renormalized. And if we go along the flat directions, this thing and this thing are gone. And we are left only with this, which cannot be renormalized. This is what we proved yesterday. So the only thing that can be renormalized is the coefficient of x squared. I like to, call it, to keep it there. This is kind of anomalous dimension for x. But some people like to perform the wave, func the wave function renormalization. And then it would be renormalization of what we call f. And you are right that in the leading order, it's independent of x. But at high orders, it depends on x. So you might get away with it at this order, but that's not the correct conceptual answer. So now that we understand all these things, we can ask, what does this thing look like? So in the exercise that you will do, you will work out the spectrum and compute this formula. And you will get a curve that looks like this with the minimum at the origin. So we get an effective potential. So these were various remarks. And now we have v effective of x, which has some constant, which might have some divergences in it plus some m square for x, x absolute value square plus dot, dot, dot. That's true for x absolute value going to 0. And as x absolute value going to infinity, we get f square, took it to be real, 1 plus constant I'll call gamma x. I'll explain everything, log hx over m cutoff. absolute value square plus dot, dot, dot. So what do we see near the origin? Near the origin, the field x acquires a mass. That's good. We have a stable minimum. The vacuum degeneracy was lifted. At large x, the potential grows logarithmically. The coefficient of the logarithm is called gamma x because it's the anomalous dimension of x. We see here something which figured in Wittenstocks. At large field strength, we can use asymptotic, in this theory it's not asymptotic freedom, but we can use perturbation theory. And there, we see the log dependence on x is a reflection of the log divergence in the cutoff. The only dimensionless thing is the m cutoff divided by x. So we get this log here with a coefficient, which is the anomalous dimension. The sign of the anomalous dimension is such that the logarithm goes up. That's important. Otherwise, the potential would have gone down, and the theory would have broken down. There is a very, very important point I would like to emphasize here which has caused enormous confusion in the literature. This whole discussion that I'm having here is for weak coupling. So there's a dimensionless quantity h, which y, which is h f over m square, absolute value square. I need it to be less than 1. And I'm really expanding powers of y. So I'm working in perturbation theory. And I'm expanding in h. But this f over m squared can be arbitrary. There are two regi reg different regions in the parameter space and in field space where the answer simplifies. One of them is this y is infinitesimal, which means that not only h is small, but if you wish, f is of order m squared, or even better, if f is a lot smaller than m squared. In this case, the supersymmetry breaking is small. So point number one, for y much less than 1, SUSY breaking is small. The second point, which is interesting, is x absolute value going to infinity. And again, if you work out the spectrum, you will see that the spectrum, which is not supersymmetric, becomes asymptotically supersymmetric. Various particles have masses proportional to x. And the splitting in the multiplets 
either go to zero or remain constant as x goes to infinity. So these are two limits in which the theory becomes more and more supersymmetric. In these two limits, this is the exact answer at one loop. But in these two limits, where the theory is approximately supersymmetric, we can express the answer not just in terms of a superpotential, but in terms of an effective Kähler potential. So in these two limits, where the supersymmetry breaking is small, we can have a description very similar to the one we've been playing with throughout these talks with an effective superpotential, linear in x, and an effective Kähler potential, which is derived by doing a one-loop computation. So in this limit of small SUSY breaking, we can have W effective equals Fx. That's easy. But we also have K effective, which is x absolute value square. This is what we started with, plus some corrections. And if you work out this correction, it's essentially a log of x, because there's nothing else that could be here. And you work out the potential that comes from these two gadgets. You find precisely the answer which appears up there. However, it's important to emphasize that that's not always true. We can be in a situation where the one-loop approximation is still valid, but y is not infinitesimal. Or x is finite. So we had some constants here, mx, which we said mx squared, which is positive, and gamma here, which is positive. We can be in a situation where we are near the origin, and this mx is computable at one loop, but it cannot be expressed using an effective Kähler potential. This looks extremely surprising at first. And you can't imagine how much confusion in the literature was generated by this. We said on one hand that our theory is supersymmetric. We integrated out some massive fields. We even keep particles which can describe supersymmetry, the supersymmetric spectrum. We have this complex boson X and its fermionic superpartner. And they cannot be described by a supersymmetric Lagrangian in terms of W effective and K effective. This seems to be in contradiction with things I said yesterday. Also, many things which are many other places in the literature. So something has to give. How come we do not have a description in terms of a supersymmetric Lagrangian, in terms of a superpotential and a Kähler potential? So if small SUSY breaking, we can have it. But otherwise, there is no K and no W that will reproduce V, the effective potential that we computed there. How can we understand that? The reason is that we can still write things in terms of k effective. But we have to include higher order corrections, which are terms of the form dx square, d bar square, x bar and some function of x absolute value square plus dot, dot, dot. This is very schematic. So we must include terms which include higher the de covariant derivatives. In other words, the Lagrangian must be supersymmetric. But nobody tells us that the supersymmetric Lagrangian that we will write down can be written with only with the Kähler potential without covariant derivatives. Now, wait a minute. I said yesterday that when we have a supersymmetric theory, or in fact, any theory that we have, by the time we go to low energies, we can expand it in powers of derivatives. And we can expand in power of derivatives because derivatives give us factors of momentum, and we are interested in low momentum processes. So 
This looks surprising. On one, in non-supersymmetric theories, we can always expand the number of derivatives. And if we want to write a, a theory with up to two derivatives, like the pi on Lagrangian, we keep two derivatives. We want to work better if we are Lutweiler and Gazer and others. Then we include terms with more derivatives. And if we are really ambitious, we can add more and more derivatives. And there is a systematic expansion in the number of derivatives. The same thing is true in supersymmetric theories if supersymmetry is not spontaneously broken. But if supersymmetry is spontaneously broken, the expansion in the number of derivatives breaks down. How does it break down? If we write this thing in components, we can still expand in the number of ordinary derivatives. But we are not allowed to expand in the number of these covariant derivatives. Because the covariant derivatives can give us the auxiliary field F, and if supersymmetry breaking is large, the auxiliary field can be, back, can be big, and the expansion in powers of the auxiliary field can break down. Example, Nima is going to work out for us the MSSM using a spurion. This is the language that comes there. And everything will look nice and supersymmetric, and I hope you will emphasize that this is true only insofar as the supersymmetry breaking is small. If the supersymmetry breaking is not small, this expansion is terrible. One needs to include various terms with covariant derivatives of the spurion, the analog of our x. And these terms with covariant derivatives of x can be as important as the other terms. So when is the, the description of supersymmetric theories in terms of k-effective and w-effective good? First, if supersymmetry is not spontaneously broken, then all the auxiliary fields are parametrically small. We can forget about them. We can expand in them. Second, even if supersymmetry is broken, if there is a sense in which the supersymmetry breaking is small, if the supersymmetry breaking is not small, there is no way to keep only these two terms and drop terms with high derivatives. And if you don't believe that, do the computation, of this one loop computation, look at the answer, and try and find a k effective and w effective which do the job. And you will see that there isn't any. And there doesn't have to be. In fact, it's clear that there cannot be any, because nothing in the world is going to stop us from writing such terms. And such terms could be as important as this. Question. Somebody raise his hand. Yes. Uh, so what exactly is meant by the supersymmetry breaking being small? Like, is it the value of y? Or, uh, yeah. OK, in this particular, in whenever you expand in x, X will be a superfield. Let me say one more word, and then it will be completely clear. So let's be in a situation where we can describe it in terms of k-effective and w-effective. In this case, it's nothing but example number two. So example number one appears in applications as the classical approximation of the Orafferty model. So example number one is the classical approximation of example number three. And example number two is the one-loop correction of example number three. In other words, the Orafferty model at the classical level gives us the trivial example number one. At one loop correction, supersymmetry breaking is small, we find example number two. But whether supersymmetry breaking is small or not, we can always write it like this. We can always integrate out the massive boson, as I did in example number two, and find an effective Lagrangian for the Goldstino. What about the corrections? If supersymmetry breaking is small, this is the statement that the mass of the boson X is a lot smaller than the scale of supersymmetry breaking. So there is a sense in which the Lagrangian with the massive boson X is approximately supersymmetric. At least we have the right degrees of freedom. We have seen that in example number two. The mass of the boson, which is like our X, is F over M. F has dimensions of mass square. M is in the denominator. So if this thing is small relative to root F, then the amount of supersymmetry breaking is small. And the hierarchy of the spectrum is at the scale M, there is some new physics. And then supersymmetry breaking is at the scale F. And then there is another boson with a tiny mass. If we have a supersymmetric description of all that, supersymmetry is approximately preserved. And since it's approximately preserved, we can describe things in using an effective k. If, however, this f is of order m, 
which can certainly happen in applications or even in this Orafferty model. The amount of supersymmetry breaking is not small. There is no way to describe the answer in terms of an effective K, an effective W. That's not a good approximation. Yet, we can integrate out the boson and find the same good old Akulo Volkov Lagrangian, because that just follows from the symmetries. Going back to the MSSM, if the amount of supersymmetry breaking is small, which means that the scale of supersymmetry breaking is sufficiently small relative to some high scale, technically it's called the mediation scale, then the expansion with the spurion or with the field X in terms of an effective Kähler potential and effective superpotential is valid. If that's not the case, we cannot do that. This does not mean that the theory is not supersymmetric. It is supersymmetric, but this correction term is important. Now, this is something that might seem like a technicality to you, but you cannot imagine how many wrong papers exist because people didn't understand that. The next topic I'd like to discuss is when is supersymmetry breaking, broken? So I'm switching topics. So are there any questions? Yes. This sounds almost exactly the same as uh, mass breaking in the Kylo Lagrangian isostate breaking. Is that one way of thinking about this? Uh, no, because the mass breaking or isospin breaking in the Kylo Lagrangian is explicit breaking of the symmetry. And I really emphasize that I'm not discussing explicit breaking here. I'm discussing spontaneous breaking. The theory is still supersymmetric. Supersymmetry is spontaneously broken. This is the same as having the pion Lagrangian. Analogous situation in the pion physics is, imagine the mass of, there is a particle called the sigma particle, which is really, nobody ever saw it. So there isn't really a sigma particle, but let's pretend there is one. Then if there is a sigma particle, we can write a linear sigma model for it in the pion Lagrangian. So if the mass of the sigma is very, very small, we can write everything with linear Lagrangians and be very happy. Unfortunately, the mass of the sigma is very large. So it's so large that we cannot even discuss the sigma particle. It makes no sense to discuss the sigma particle. This is not to say that SU2 breaking is small. Another example, which Nima emphasized yesterday, is the standard model. Why do we write the standard model? Because the mass of the Higgs is light. If the Higgs, as the Higgs becomes heavier and heavier, as in some technicolor models, we cannot, call, we cannot discuss particle the Higgs. There is no Higgs, the Higgs. There is no particle like this, just like the sigma model. It's a mess. Is the nonlinear description valid? Absolutely yes. Is there a good linear description? Probably not. At very short distances, the theory is invariant under chiral symmetry. In this case, the standard model is under SU2 cross, SU2 cross SU2. So at very short distances, there's another Lagrangian with other degrees of freedom, but that's not what we are discussing. So that's a, a better analogy. Other questions? Okay. I'm going to the next topic. And again, I'm in the spirit of making the model slightly gradually more interesting and slightly more realistic, but on the other hand, more complex. So, so far we had these three examples, which would always be a good idea to go back to because they demonstrate different things. And the question now is, can we generalize the Orafferty model? Can we find other models in which supersymmetry is spontaneously broken? And in particular, we would like to have models. Ah, here is an idea. And in particular, we would like to have models which are very complicated, perhaps involving non-perturbative field theory dynamics and various other things. So we would like to have complicated models, breaking supersymmetry, and we would like to have criteria which will tell us is supersymmetry broken or not. So there are various criteria that one can use which are extremely helpful in special cases, but I'd like to present one particularly simple principle which seems to be always true, and it's almost a theorem. It's, a, it's what physicists call a theorem. 
in the sense that it has a lot of fine print which tell you when to be careful with it, and even then it's not always true, but that's good enough for physicists. Where is the big chalk? Okay, so we are going to ask ourselves, imagine we have a very, very complicated theory with some superpotential, which is a function of various fields, phi i, and we are going to ask ourselves, does this model break supersymmetry or not? And we just assume it's three-level physics. No fancy non-perturbative effect. Well, we already gave the answer. Susie is unbroken. If and only if we can solve this equation. So these are n equations with n unknowns. If we manage to solve them, we found, find a solution. And then supersymmetry is unbroken. And this solution describes the vacuum of the system. If we can't solve the equations, supersymmetry is broken, then we have to work a little bit harder to find where the ground state is. Now, one of you could come and scream, look, this is stupid. W is holomorphic. It's a function of n variables. We have n equations with n unknowns. It's even holomorphic. This is typically a solution. So if W is generic, Then there are solutions. I use this notation of exist to really demonstrate that this is a theorem. <laughs> so if W is generic, in the sense that I will soon make very precise, we have n equations with n unknowns, so they have a solution. No big deal. Conclusion, generic theories don't break supersymmetry. It's not easy to break supersymmetry because generic theories don't, don't do that. We have to work very hard to find examples which do break supersymmetry. Now, what do I mean by generic? Generic means that if you found W, any W you found, change the parameters a little bit and demand that the answers won't change dramatically. It's not that you picked the, the coefficients very, very accurately for things to work out. This is a good definition of generic. So it's true not only for particular values of the parameters, but in a finite neighborhood around, every, around in the parameter space. So the generic theory does not break supersymmetry. Now let's look at things which are still generic, but constrain the parameters. Imagine we have a symmetry in the problem. For simplicity, assume it's U1. So if we have a U1 symmetry, then W will not be generic because all the terms in W will have to preserve the U1 symmetry. So if particles I has charge QI, if phi I goes to E to the I alpha QI phi I, this means that, uh, I think I should put an upper index for phi. This means that field phi I has charge QI. Well, we can just change variables and say W is not an arbitrary function of all the phi i, but it has to be invariant. What does it mean? Take one of the phi's, say phi 1, which has charge q1, and say that it's an arbitrary function of phi i, which is not equal to 1, to the power 1 over q1, qi, over phi, I'm not right anymore phi i over phi 1 to the power q1, and this is to the power qi. So i not equal to 1. And what this is saying in plain English is that we started with n fields and one symmetry, and therefore we can form n minus 1 invariants. So this is nothing but a change of variables in the space of phi's. And now we can again go to try and solve these equations. So now we say, ah, maybe now we can do better because we have only n minus 1 variables. So now we have n equations with n minus 1 variables. Maybe it will be good and we'll fail to solve a solution. We'll be, fail to find a solution. But instead, these are really n minus 1 equations with n minus 1 variables, so this does not help. 
So having a global U1 symmetry does not help. Generically, you can solve. So now we have n minus 1 equations with n minus 1 unknowns. Unknowns. So exist solution. And again, generically. We can tune the parameters such that there is no solution, but this will be unstable, because if you slightly change the parameters, the solution will emerge. There is only one way to guarantee that the equations are linearly independent, right? How can we fail to find a solution? We'll fail to find the solution if uh, we have more equations than unknowns. And there's only one way to do that. Assume that the theory has an R symmetry, under which, again, phi i goes to e to the i alpha R charge i times phi i. This is fundamentally different than an ordinary symmetry because the superpotential must carry R charge 2. So the superpotential must be a quasi-homogeneous function of the phi i's locally. So let's do it in practice using change of variables. So we'll pick one of them, say phi 1, and raise it to a power 2 over R1. So W. So this object has R charge 2. And now we'll just write an arbitrary function, f of phi i to the 1 over ri, oh, sorry, to the r1 divided by phi 1 to the power ri. So that these are invariant. So these are r invariant. This has r charge 2. So the most general superpotential, which has r charge 2, is of this form. So using the symmetry, we indeed manage to reduce a problem with n variables to a problem with n minus 1 variables. But now, the stationary condition includes n equations. So now we are in a very happy situation, very happy because with U1R, we have n equations with n minus 1 unknowns. No. So generically, no solution. So what is our goal? Our goal is to find a superpotential which breaks supersymmetry. We need that for the real world. If supersymmetry has anything to do with the real world, we need to break supersymmetry. And what we seem to conclude from here is that the only way to do that is that if the theory has a U1R symmetry. If there is no U1R symmetry, with or without other symmetries, it doesn't matter. If the superpotential is generic, we can always find stationary points, and hence, supersymmetry is unbroken. If, however, there is a U1R symmetry, we can be in better shape and manage to break supersymmetry. So I gave you kind of a rough, first, rough, broad brush description of the argument, but there's a lot of fine print which needs to be emphasized. And this is true in every theorem in physics. Number one, I divided by this phi one. I have all these fractional powers here. This makes sense if the vacuum has non-zero expectation value for phi one, which means that the R symmetry is broken. Even if phi one vanishes at the vacuum, but some other field has a VEV, it doesn't matter. I will just switch which one I call phi one. So that's not a big deal. If we have an R symmetry which is not spontaneously broken, I cannot pull this trick. And there, it's more likely that supersymmetry will be unbroken. Remember, recall, success in this game is now break supersymmetry. If we fail to break supersymmetry, then we failed. So if, super, if there is an R symmetry and it is spontaneously broken, this argument is valid. If, however, the R symmetry is not broken, 
we need to work a little bit harder. Now, somebody here had a question, and I promised there would be an opportunity to ask. Yes. Yes. Uh, I mean, you had a non-specific backward, but it was evident from the uh, bill is that the answer would be done. Yeah, I deliberately kept it there so that it will be easier for you to ask the question. If there is no R symmetry, then supersymmetry is almost never broken, unless I really tune the parameters. If there is an R symmetry and it's not spontaneously broken, it can go either way. The example I presented there was such a supersymmetry was broken. This is very common, even with unbroken supersymmetry. And it's also true in example number three. Example number three was nothing but a UV completion of example number two. So I'm not saying that if the R symmetry is broken, supersymmetry is, sorry, I'm not saying that if the R symmetry is unbroken, supersymmetry is unbroken. How many negations did I have in this sentence? Way too many, but I think I got it straight. <laughs> I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if there is no R symmetry at all, the Gadget supersymmetry will not break. If there is an R symmetry and it is broken spontaneously, then supersymmetry is broken. If there is an R symmetry and it's not spontaneously broken, we need to work a little bit more. That's what I'm saying. In the example there, we had an R symmetry. It was not spontaneously broken in the, in the vacuum, and yet supersymmetry was broken. Here is an example of the opposite. Do you want an example of the opposite? Take a free massive chiral superfield. So the superpotential is phi square. There is an R symmetry under which phi has R charge one. Supersymmetry is unbroken. So this looks like a very simple example. So as I said, if there is an R symmetry and it's not spontaneously broken, it can go either way. This is an extremely powerful tool. And in the remaining five minutes, I'll show some consequences of it. But before I do that, I would like to emphasize No, I won't do that. Yeah, I won't do that. So now let's try. We're really interested in situations which are more generic. So we don't like symmetries, so let's try and break the symmetries explicitly. Somebody here brought up the chiral, yes? If the R symmetry is phi, there's no symmetry. I'm sorry? If the R symmetry is bigger, like SU2 or SU2? The R symmetry cannot be SU2 in yeah. n equals 1. There is an SU2 in n equals 2 supersymmetry, and n equals 2 supersymmetry is a beautiful theory, which is very close to my heart. However, it doesn't break supersymmetry, so it does not describe nature. Painful as it is. No, it works beautifully. N equals two supersymmetry doesn't break supersymmetry. The, the, our goal here is to figure out when does supersymmetry break. So if we are trying to find models of the universe, we would like to find a, a model in which supersymmetry spontaneously breaks. So N equals two, as I said, is a beautiful theory, but it doesn't break supersymmetry. The more generic theories and with n equals one supersymmetry do break supersymmetry. Some of them do, some of them don't. And I'm giving you a criterion here which will very efficiently tell you whether a model does or does not break supersymmetry. So in physics, whenever we have global symmetries, which is a well, let's break it a little bit. So we try to take this model, which has a U1R symmetry, supersymmetry is broken. Let's break it a little bit and see what happens. Like somebody here asked me, what about quark masses in the chiral Lagrangian? Yeah, we have a beautiful symmetry. Now let's try explicitly break it. We can't do it with a gauge symmetry. Gauge symmetry cannot be explicitly broken. And that's not because of the gauge symmetry. It's because it's not a symmetry, as Nima emphasized. So gauge symmetry is not a symmetry, and therefore it cannot be explicitly broken. You cannot explicitly break a non-symmetry. So let's take a model which has the following property. It has an R symmetry. So we have a superpotential. 
which has, so the full model has an R symmetry, which we explicitly break. And for the purpose of this discussion, it's enough to discuss just the superpotential. So we have a superpotential W0, which is R invariant. And we add a small perturbation, epsilon, W1, which breaks the R symmetry. Explicit breaking. Even though I'm not telling you what W0 is and what W1 is, just the fact that what we had before, so it said this is R invariant and the U1R is spontaneously broken. So we assume that for epsilon equals zero, we have a theory which has a U1R symmetry. And we were very successful. The U1R symmetry is spontaneously broken. Or even without that, the, R, the supersymmetry is broken. So let me make it more general and say SUSY is broken. For example, the Orafati model that we had before. And now we perturb the model a little bit and would like to analyze it. I claim that this model can be analyzed, even though I'm telling you practically nothing about the model. I'm not telling you what the fields are. I'm not telling you what W0 is, what W1 is. We can say quite a lot about this model. How do we do that? And perturbation theory is always a good thing to do. But it's important in perturbation theory that you have really have a small parameter that you can make parametrically small. And yeah, I'll leave it at that. So for epsilon equals 0, we have some potential. The ground state energy is non-zero. And supersymmetry is spontaneously broken. How do we see from this picture that the super, that supersymmetry is broken? Who said that? Very good. So here, supersymmetry is broken. And we happily sit here at the vacuum. And everything is nice. This is what I did earlier in the talk. We found a model that breaks supersymmetry, and it has a nice isolated vacuum. And we work out the MSSM and whatever we want. Now we turn on infinitesimal epsilon. What will it do? Well, let's first analyze what it can do in here. Around here, it's a small correction, so the masses will move a little bit. Maybe the vacuum will move a little bit. But since epsilon is small and everything is under control, no dramatic change can happen. And therefore, the situation will remain more or less as is. However, we had this theorem. This model doesn't have an R symmetry. If it has no R symmetry, when epsilon is non-zero, supersymmetry must be unbroken. How can that be? How can it be that for epsilon equals zero, supersymmetry is broken, but for epsilon equals 10 to the minus 100, supersymmetry is unbroken? Any suggestions? Yep, very good. You must have read the suggested literature. So very, very far in field space, somewhere on this blackboard, <laughs> the potential comes down and must go to 0. And here, the fields can be 1 over of order 1 over epsilon, 1 over epsilon square. It doesn't matter. So as epsilon goes to 0, this non-supersymmetric vacuum, this non-supersymmetric vacuum, for epsilon equals 0, the non-supersymmetric, sorry, for epsilon equals 0, we have a non-supersymmetric vacuum here. And that's all there is. For small but non-zero epsilon, Another vacuum comes in from infinity and restores supersymmetry. So models like this have a phenomenon which we can call metastable. Susie breaking. So having an exact U1R symmetry basically guarantees SUSY breaking. And having an approximate U1R symmetry does not mean that the world is approximately supersymmetric, 
but it means that the world has the same spontaneous supersymmetry breaking that we had before, but it's matter stable. And the barrier between the non-supersymmetric state and the supersymmetric state, which is very far, this barrier grows and grows as epsilon goes to zero. I claim that this is what we need for the real world. And it's almost inevitable for the real world. And again, like every theorem, it has a lot of caveats and fine print. So let me just argue for that. Nima is going to present the MSSM. The MSSM does not have an R symmetry. It doesn't have an R symmetry because the gay genos have a mass. Gay geno masses break the R symmetry. Now, somebody might say, well, maybe there is an R symmetry, but it is spontaneously broken. Maybe the universe has an exact U1 R symmetry, but it is spontaneously broken. This cannot happen for a variety of reasons. Number one, there are strong bounds on the existence of exactly massless Goldstone bosons. The first approximation, again, every sentence I say now has some caveats, but bear with me. The thrust of the argument is valid, or is almost always valid. So, for first approximation, there are no exactly massless Goldstone bosons in our universe. So we cannot have an exact U1R invariant theory, which is spontaneously broken. So we can't have that. On the other hand, we must have gay genome masses. So the only way to do that is that if the R symmetry is explicitly broken. If, on the other hand, we want supersymmetry to be broken, we are really driven to this situation. So very general considerations about nature, the fact that we want supersymmetry to be approximate, so we have spontaneous SUSY breaking at low energies. I'm, in this approximation, I neglect any correction due to gravity. So gravitational corrections can invalidate the argument. So if I'm just working within field theory, and I want a model that breaks supersymmetry, gives gay genome masses, and does not have Goldstone bosons, exactly masters Goldstone bosons, this picture is inevitable. This is really surprising because I did not say much about phenomenology here. I did not talk about the mass of the proton or precision measurements in LEP or LHC or whatever. From very general qualitative considerations of what we want to have in a model with supersymmetry, we'll learn that we are unstable. Namely, we live in a situation like this, and we have to ensure that the lifetime to come here is sufficiently large. And again, Nima had some flavor of this kind of reasoning in his talk yesterday. So given that we are unstable, I think we should go to lunch now. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. Uh, we have a TA session, and I hope 